Well, good morning. This is 1132. Sorry, I'm two minutes late getting started, but I'm back recording again. Uh, it was pretty amazing what happened. Uh, what day was it? It was yesterday, yesterday, uh, right after my Calculus 2 class. Uh, I had 20 minutes before my differential equation class was to start and uh, went downstairs, get a little something to drink and snack. Uh, and my wife said, when I came down the stairs, she said, guess what? We just got the internet back. All right. So uh, then I was going to quit using her hotspot, which was very unreliable. I quit having to use the uh, um, iPad, which was very small and hard to, to deal with and having to write on piece of paper and show it to the camera and that kind of stuff it was it was pretty brutal uh, so I uh, we got that done and uh, then while we were there talking about it in jubilation that the internet was back we heard something and Karen said what fell I said I don't know she said could it have been a package I said let me go see I went into the living room and saw the UPS truck on the side of the street and I said, yes, I went, opened the door. There were two packages. The guy was just getting into his truck. I bent down to pick them up in my excitement. I thought, nope, I can't do that. I'm not supposed to touch anything. So Karen came out, got them, wiped the packages down, opened them up. And sure enough, there was the adapter for my computer and the battery for my computer. And we had just gotten the internet back. So we're back in the saddle again. I can record. I can write on the screen. Uh, it's back like it was before. So uh, I'm sorry that y'all aren't here to share my jubilation, but in case you're wondering why things are back to normal, they are. So let me go on and open this to uh, current slide. And since I'm recording now, well, I was going to try to do current slide. There we go. Uh, I still don't see anybody here yet just me. So um, <clears throat> I guess I'll just go on and proceed. Now the trouble is, I guess I forgot to make a mark on the page of where we left off last time. Um, I know that we did example four, or we were doing example four, and I can't remember now if we got cut off, that the internet, internet went down. I think that's what happened. I believe that is what happened. We were doing example four, and I believe the internet went out, and I don't know that we finished it. Sorry about that. We didn't get much done at all, and it was just lousy, lousy internet, and it was pretty miserable. Then in my next class, I couldn't get it back again until about more than an hour. Well, awfully close to an hour into the next class before it came back. And amazingly, I still had about four or five people that were still in the next class waiting. And so they got it. So anyway, what we'll do here is I will do... Uh, Start example four from scratch, okay? Is anyone here yet? I thought I heard something. Nope, still just me. As soon as someone comes aboard, I've got to try to remember to do a major announcement I need to make. Now, example four, if you don't, if you come in in the middle of it, you don't see what I've done, that type of thing, then by all means, go to LarsonLinearAlgebra.com. You can see an interactive example of this type of uh, interactive version of this type of example. Now, I'm pretty sure we got started on this. I just don't remember when the internet went out and when I lost y'all, uh, but I don't think we got to finish. I think I finished the problem myself, was ready to show it to you, and it never came back again. Well, that's my memory. Maybe my memory is bad. I'm only teaching eight classes. I don't see how I could forget. But anyway, here we go. Let me get my pen set up. Okay. Here's the problem. Solve this system of equation using Kramer's rule. Minus x plus 2y 
minus 3z is equal to 1. First equation. Second equation. 2x plus z is equal to 0. Third equation. 3x minus 4y plus 4z is equal to 2. Now, if you were just doing this, okay, this would not be a hard problem to solve. I wouldn't do uh, row reduction or anything else. What I would do, I'd say z is equal to negative 2x and plug negative 2x into my other two equations that I get left from the second equation here. Plug that in for z in the first two equations, in the first and the last equations. Then you have equations in x and y only. And then solve that two by two. Pretty simple to do. And once you've got that done, plug them back in and you got it done. We're not looking for the easiest way here. We're illustrating how you use Kramer's rule. Okay. And here's what Kramer's rule does. You start with the coefficient matrix, and we'll call it A because that's what they always call it. And the A, the coefficient matrix, it should look familiar, negative 1, 2, negative 3. We're not going to do a row reduction on it. That would be pretty easy to. 2, 0, 1. And 3, negative 4, 4. That would be your, that's your coefficient matrix. Now, we have three other pertinent matrices here, okay? Now, notice we've only used the coefficients. We didn't use our three numbers at all, okay? Here's where we use the other three numbers. We name for the first variable, which is going to be x. In fact, I think I would like to call it a sub x, but the book calls it a sub 1. a sub 1 will be the Basically, you start with the coefficient matrix, okay? But you substitute, instead of the coefficients for x, you put the constants in. So that will be a 1, 0, 2, and then the other two columns are the same, uh, 2, 0, negative 4, and negative 3, 1, and 4. And by the way, the problem here says use Kramer's rule to solve the systems of linear equations for x. We're going to do that. And this is all you would need for that. But then uh, the remark in the side says go on and use it for the other two as well. So since we're writing, I'm going to write down the other two as well. Okay? A sub 2, which I would call A sub y because it makes more sense to call it that. A sub 2. So I'll go what they did. Again, use your coefficient matrix, except for the middle row, you put in the your coefficients of y, since this is the a sub y, I want to call it, you put in the constants at the end. So it would be a minus 1, 2, 3 is the first column, and then here you put your 1, 0, 2, that's your constants at the end, because those are the coefficients for your second variable, y, and then negative 3, 1, 4. Okay? And while we're at it, let's go and do a sub 3, which I would call a sub z in this case. But uh, let me make sure nobody's joined the class yet. Nope, still just me. But I am recording, and that's the good news. We've got that feature back, so we don't just waste the class period. If no one's here, I get to keep on trucking. Use that A matrix again, just like we had before, minus 1, 2, 3, and 2, 0, 4, negative 4, okay? Just like before, except then for the, instead of the coefficients of the third variable, negative 3, 1, 4, we put in the constants, 1, 0, 2. All right, those are the four matrices. Now, what we've got to do here is take the determinant of each of those. Okay. Now, 
And I'll start with the A matrix. Uh, and to me, to do the determinant of the A matrix, there's several ways you can, but it's just about as easy to do our good old uh, determinant of A would then be the determinant of negative 1 to 3 to 0, 4, negative 4, I keep forgetting that negative 4, negative 3, 1, 4. Okay? And repeat the first two columns. Okay? So that will be uh, negative 1, 2, 3, and a 2, 0, 4. Okay? And then do, that's not really a determinant, but I'm putting it there to show we're doing the determinant thing. First down diagonal, zero. Second down diagonal, six. Third down diagonal, negative uh, 24, minus 24. Okay, not too bad. I'm going to erase, because I can do that now, uh, these. So they won't be in the way and go back and do my up diagonals which are going to be negated but that one's just a zero <laughs> done this would have been a four it now becomes a minus four this one would have been a 16 but it's because it's a negative it's a minus 16 okay i've done it again not that it matters any here, but I left off that minus sign. That 4 doesn't want to have a minus sign with it. So that's a minus 16. So what do we have here? That's minus 40 minus 4. I've done something wrong here. I'm pretty sure that was way too big a number. But let me go on and see. Okay. <clears throat> minus 40. Minus 4 is minus 44. Okay, let's do it this way. These two add to be minus 10. And that, oh, Dawson's here, right? Wait just a minute. I forgot to do something at the end of my last class. Dawson, can you hear me? Yeah. All right, good deal. And if you haven't picked up on it, I had, jubilation was in the house yesterday, um, many times over, I'll go over it in just a second, let me go on and mark you present, okay, don't want to forget that, um, yesterday morning, okay, you probably saw the email and stuff, and you had known from before that my computer went out, the uh, adapter from AC to DC, and uh, also, the backup battery, all that kind of stuff was was in very weak shape. And that, uh, what was it? Monday evening, a week ago, a week ago Monday, uh, it started going out. My wife ordered a new one, uh, ordered it online, and uh, both the adapter and the battery. And they said it would be two to six days getting here, okay? Sending it FedEx. So that went out. So then I was, and then meantime, she, I think we had a class when I was on her iPad that all we could do was look at each other pretty much um, at that point because it happened that day and we didn't. Well, she got to working on an old computer we had that had Windows Vista on it, and she got a, I think, a free version of uh, Windows 10 from her work. Uh, got it, loaded it, it wasn't an easy process, and managed to get it done. She got it done, and uh, so I started using that then probably the next day. It didn't have Screencast-O-Matic, and it didn't have a writable screen. So, missing two major features there, but at least I could run PowerPoint. On her iPad, I couldn't run anything. <laughs> uh, you could just We could just talk. And I think all the classes said, look, just do, and we, we had to figure out what to do next. So anyway, we did that for a while. Um, 
then, let me see if I can remember what day that was. It was Monday of this week at 1120 in the morning, uh, near the end of my Calculus One class, our internet went out here. Now, we're not sure, but we think it had something to, to do with the storms that were the night before, but obviously it wasn't caused directly by the storms. We think that someone doing some repair or limb removal or something must have knocked out a node or something somewhere, and anyway, we went down. The whole area went down, and we talked about this. You're on Spectrum 2, and then I have another student on Spectrum who lives in Bessemer. Both of you still had your Spectrum. Over here on this side of town, no Spectrum, okay? So we were out there. So then I went back to the uh, uh, iPad and started recording on iPad and writing things on a piece of paper and holding them up. You remember seeing that, right? That was pretty miserable. But then yesterday morning after the Cal 2 class uh, and before my differential equation class, I had a 20-minute break. I went downstairs just to get something to drink and snack on. And Karen said, guess what? The internet just came up. Yay, team. The internet was back. We were celebrating that when we heard something and she, did some, she said, did something fall? And I said, I don't know. She said, that could have been a package maybe. Well, let me check. Went out there and sure enough, we had a package. And that package was, uh, 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 it was UPS. I saw the truck. They had shipped the second one by UPS. Never have heard from FedEx, you know. In fact, the guy I talked with, he came and made a delivery late a couple nights ago. And I'd asked him about it the Friday night before. So he had made another delivery on Monday evening. And uh, he said he would check on it the next day. Never heard anything. When I asked him that Monday evening, uh, he said, I talked with the guy who, made, who had the route that night. He couldn't remember anything. He said, frankly, I can't either. People ask me a week later if I remember delivering this and so. I say, no, I have hundreds of deliveries. I can't remember. Yeah, he said he couldn't remember. He said, what they do is just say, reorder. <laughs> and they go back to the company and say, send another one. And evidently, they've been doing a lot of that because all over our neighborhood association, there have been so many complaints about FedEx misdelivering packages, not delivering packages, and that kind of stuff. So anyway, I said, well, we've already made the request to the company. They're sending it, and they're sending it UPS. And I couldn't believe what the guy said. He said, that's a smart move. <laughs> I said, what? He said, oh, I don't actually work for you for FedEx. I work for a contractor who contracts us out to do this. So I have no loyalty to the company here. In fact, people ask me, well, how do I go about shipping nowadays? He said, go to UPS. <laughs> That's what the FedEx driver told me. He said, they're really in a lousy, lousy situation. I don't know why, but they're not doing well. So anyway, it came. So within 20 minutes, in a 20-minute break, I had internet back, and I had my adapter, I had the battery, I rapidly came upstairs and got set up, I was able to teach the next two classes yesterday the old way, and that's what I'm doing now. I can write on my screen again, as you see, and I'm recording, as you can see that too. We're back in the saddle, so sorry to take that much time. How are you doing? Everything okay? Okay, we haven't heard from Josh yet, have we? Nope, still just Dawson. Okay, now, you were here last time that we met. Uh, yeah, you were here on Tuesday. How far did we get in example three, called, uh, example four, because that's when the internet went out, I mean, not went out, it's when I couldn't get user hotspot. I mean, see, what I was using at the internet went out, was her hotspot, and the reason I had to use the iPad was because the second computer that we were using, it just would not pick up her signal from the hotspot nearly as well as the iPad did. So I went to using her iPad, but even that got weak, very weak. So uh, uh, I can't remember when I lost it. Did we finish example four, or we were right in the middle of it? All I have is example four right now. 
and nothing more. Okay. Well, I've been doing example four before you came on. I've written down the equation up there, the set of system of equations. I wrote down the coefficient matrix. And then now the problem asks for just solve uh, that for x. So what we do for x, using Kramer's rule, by the way. So what you do with Kramer's rule, notice we never use the constants at all. We just use the coefficient matrix, matrix A. For Kramer's rule, to find the x, we substitute in the coefficient matrix. Instead of the coefficients for the x variable, we put the constant column in there, 1, 0, 2. And then you use the rest of the coefficient matrix just as it was written. Okay? And I'm having to check something because my answer isn't coming out what I expect it to do. And I worked it the other day and it came out right, so I think I put a number down wrong, but I'm going to have to check that in a minute. Okay? And then since at the bottom of the page it says go and apply Kramer's rule and get the other two solutions too. So for the y's, I'm calling, the book calls it a sub 2. I would call it a sub y. You put the constants in instead of the coefficients for y. So the coefficients for x go in, the constants go in for the y coefficients, and then the coefficients for z go in. And then for the a sub 3, I would call a sub z, but they call it a sub 3. You put the constants in instead of the coefficients for z. So you put the coefficients for x, the coefficients for y, and the constants for the z coefficient. And then I was doing the determinant of that A matrix. Now the reason I'm starting there, and we'll get to this in Kramer's rule in a minute. Let's just start there, put uh, that. And maybe you can find where I made a mistake because I've got a mistake here, okay? Um, negative one, two, three, two, zero, negative four, negative three, one, four. That's right, the negative one, two, three, Two, zero, four. Everything looks right. I did my down diagonal was zero. Down diagonal was six. Ah, that's it. My third down diagonal I got wrong. So let me go back and erase. Okay. Those will probably be okay, but let me go back. Okay. Down diagonal. This was zero. This was 6. This was positive 24. Okay. So let me take out that. Okay. That's where my error was. Now, sorry. Let me erase my lines. Oh, it's so fun having my ionizing pen back. It's been so long. Okay. Oh, time out a moment. Uh, big announcement that I think I saw it the first time yesterday and I forgot to tell the class that you're in yesterday this but it wasn't being recorded anyway so you wouldn't have heard it anyway um, they have finally opened student course evaluations for spring term that's for the full term courses and for the second mini term courses first mini term they were open way back but this is for full term and second many term courses. They are now open. If you go to your email and open the email that tells you about them, in that should be a link. Click on the link. You go right there. And once you're there, uh, you can just do all your student course evaluations. Uh, you, you remember how to log in and all that kind of stuff, right? Okay. Uh, student ID, I think, is your login number. That's a seven-digit number. And your birth date is your eight-digit uh, password, and it's always the first, the four-digit year first, then the two-digit month, then the two-digit day. Okay. So now let's do our up diagonals here. That was the paid commercial announcement. Okay. That's a zero. This is a plus four because it's an up diagonal. That becomes a minus four. Okay. And then this up diagonal is also a plus, which becomes a minus, and that's a minus 16. Okay? So this produces a minus 10. This produces, well, actually easier to do this. This is a plus 30 and a minus 20. And that gives you a 10. And that is your uh, determinant 
of your coefficient matrix. Now, the reason I do that first before I do the others is number one. Can you think of a reason I, that we ought to do it first? If that determinant were zero, what would that mean? Either no solutions or an infinite number of solutions. Okay? This would not have a unique solution. So, do that first to see if this is even a solvable matrix. In other words, is that A matrix invertible? If it's not invertible, there is no, uh, you can't use Kramer's rule, okay? Because there's not a unique solution. And here's the other reason, because of what Kramer's rule did. Uh, this, the A matrix, the determinant of the A matrix is your denominator of all your answers, okay, X, Y, and Z, okay, so that's the other reason, you're going to need it for all three of them, so now let's do the A sub 1 to get the X numerator, now that one is set up, don't do this thing that we just did, this is just set up perfectly, let's use the second row, third column, and do our determinant that way, so the determinant of A1 is okay first figure out the position of that one there okay what's the sign of that position that's a minus one so it's a minus one times the determinant of what's left the determinant of what's left is one two two negative four okay so that's going to be a minus and then this determinant is minus four Minus 4, that's minus 8, so that's going to be a plus 8. There's your determinant of your, uh, I far prefer to call this a sub x, because that's your first variable, a sub x. Okay? So let's do the, that's the numerator of that answer, x equal 8 over 10, which is 4 fifths. That's what the original problem was, and that's our answer. That would be all we had to do for example four, um, but then they say go on and do the other two. So let's do the other two. Um, the determinant of A2, okay, again that's one like we just did. So what I'm going to do is clear some space here. Sorry about this. Nice having my pen back, but it would be nice if I had more room, <laughs> okay, um, but it's way better than writing on a piece of paper and reading from the board, because we did that in at least one class, didn't we? Yeah, I thought we did. It may have been this class, okay. Oh, well, we know that's a 10, okay. So the determinant of A is 10, okay. The determinant of A1 is 8. Okay, so let's do A2. And this is one that I think we'll expand again. So this is a negative 1. Yuck. This is the other thing. It's a pain here because this is a strange screen. Negative 1, 1, negative 3, negative 1, 1. Just repeating the first two columns. 2, 0, 1, Two zero, three two four, three two. I hope I got all the signs right. Okay, because there's a minus four and a four there. I always have to check that I get it right. I think I did. Okay, let's do our down diagonals, and the first one, of course, gives us a zero. Next one gives us a three. Next one gives us a minus 12. Okay, let's go to the up diagonals. Since I can't erase, I will, because it just makes it a little less messy. I know you writing with pencil or pen, you can't do that. Okay, the first one's a zero. The 
The next one would have been a minus 2, but since you're doing up diagonal, it becomes a plus 2. And then the third one was an 8, but because it's up, there will be a minus 8. Okay, and what does that give you? So minus 12 and minus 8. Did you already answer? Negative 15. Negative 15, perfect. Negative 15. Okay, so that's your determinant of A2. All right, <laughs> I need to do the determinant of A3. Let me go and write this one in. The determinant of A2 is equal to minus 15. All right. Where do I go next? Might as well do the bottom row again. So let me erase all this, since I've already written that in. I don't miss this part of it, but it's better to have this than not have anything. Okay, let's do the determinant of A3. And again, that's a pretty easy one. Determinant of A3, or A sub Z, I would call it, is determinant of negative 1, 2, 1, 2, 0, 0, 3, negative 4, 2. I wouldn't expand this one because you have a row of mostly zeros. All but one entry is zero, so let's use that row to our advantage. Wipe out that row and the column that has the non-zero two in it, and write down first what's the sign of that two there, the sign of the position of the two. Negative. So we write a negative two, and then the determinant of what's left, two, one, negative four, two. That would be a negative 2 times 2 times 2 is 4 plus 4 is 8 this is negative 16 okay agreed so there's the determinant of a3 all right now here's where Kramer's rule comes into play all this has been setting up and making Kramer's rule really easy the x value is the determinant of a1. That's the one that you substituted the constants for the x coordinate over the determinant of a. And that would be 8 over 10, which is 4 over 5. Okay? Basically, just write down the answer. <clears throat> the y is the determinant of a2 over that same determinant of A that you don't have to do but once. Okay? And that, in this case, would be A2 was negative 15 over a 10, which would be a negative 3 half. Right? There's your Y value. And then, of course, the Z value is the determinant of A3. I would call AZ over the determinant of A, which we already know, and that would be negative 16 over negative 10, no, over 10, okay, and that would be negative 8 fifths. Okay, now, fairly easy to check understanding their fractional answers. So a negative <coughs> x would be a negative 4 fifths. Okay. Let's get that to negative 8 tenths. No, negative 4 fifths is fine. Negative 4 fifths plus 2 times y. Did that have someone coming in the class? No, okay. Um, times... 2 times a negative 3 halves would be a negative 3. So negative 4 fifths minus 15 fifths, that's going to be a negative 19 fifths, right? 
actually say. Okay? Then minus a minus, minus 3 times a minus 8 fifths is positive 24 fifths. So positive 24 fifths minus 19 fifths, is it? Yeah, is positive 5 fifths, which is 1. I love fractions, don't you? Okay. So that checks. Let's do the second one. 2 times 4 fifths, that would be 8 fifths. Minus 8 fifths, that's your Z, that's 0. That one's a lot easier. The next one going to be a little more challenging. I think I'll write this one down. <clears throat> 3 times 4 fifths would be 12 fifths. Okay. Minus 4 times a minus 3 halves, that will be a minus... Six, a plus six. Yeah, plus six. And six will be 30 fifths. Okay. All right. And then you have a plus four times a minus eight fifths. That's going to be minus 32 fifths, I think. Okay. So. Uh, see if this works out. Uh, minus 32 plus 12 would be a minus 20 plus. Now I've done something wrong. Yeah, I hate fractions. Okay. 4 fifths times 3 is 12 fifths. Plus 6 is 30 fifths. I think that's right. Minus thirty two fifths. Oh, that's right. This these two add to be a minus two fifths plus twelve fifths is plus ten fifths, and that's equal to two. So that checks too. Yeah. Okay, so sure enough, those are our answers. I knew they were, I worked them last time. Uh, four fifths, negative three halves and negative eight fifths. So, now, why do Kramer's rule if it's this many steps? Well, what if you had a certain set of equations, okay? Or, yeah, let's say equations, but you could set them equal to different outputs. So you do that one denominator determinant, the determinant of your coefficient matrix, one time, one time, you get a number. And then you just substitute that one column in, and they're not that bad to do, usually, well, at least three by threes aren't, and, and then you just change your numerators and see which one gives you your optimum output, you might say. I still don't think it's the way to do it, but it is something that's fairly easily programmable, so it can be done. All right. But all we're doing now is applications of the determinants. There's one. Kramer's rule. I guess we did earlier finding the adjoint of the matrix, which you can then use to find the inverse of the matrix. And my word, why would you ever go through that? But it is the um, application of the determinants. Now, these next ones I found very interesting. Uh, do you need this up any longer? No. no. Okay. So let's clear the screen. And the area, volumes, and equations of lines and planes. Okay. Now, it just happens to be, and it says determined to have many applications in analytic geometry, which I never would have guessed, you know, except I've done it many times. One application is find the area of a triangle in the XY plane. So what you have is three points, X1, Y1, X2, Y2, and X3, Y3. And these are the vertices of a triangle in the XY plane. 
any one of these x values can be positive, negative, zero. It doesn't matter. Any one of the y values could be positive, negative, or zero. Okay? The only requirement is that these three points can't be along the same line. If they are, you don't have a triangle. Okay? So as long as they're not collinear, you have three points that are not collinear, then here, amazingly, is the area of that triangle. You don't have to figure out a one half a base times a height. You don't have to do uh, one of your trig things. Okay? Uh, there were a couple there. Even the law of cosine one, which is uh, Hera's, Hero's or Heron's formula, whichever pronunciation you give that. But here's the area of that triangle. So this is a triangle. I'm going to subscript it that way. Now it's plus or minus. Now that seems a little bizarre, but I'll tell you why in a minute. One half times the determinant of x1, y1, 1. x2, y2, 1. x3, y3, 1. Okay? Thank goodness triangles only have three vertices, okay? But you can figure the area just by that. Now, why the plus or minus sign? Remember, determinants can come up negative. But think about it, areas can't. So if your determinant comes up negative, use the minus sign to make it a positive area. If the determinant comes up positive, just use the plus sign because that's uh, areas are always positive. So that's why you have a plus or minus sign there. You always will have a positive area. Now, their proof here is sort of a geometric proof, and this is a pretty interesting one. They do all three points in the first quadrant, which makes it easier to do. And I'll just do a real quick sketch of that. Okay, so here's your first quadrant. Okay, and you have three points here. Any three points, it doesn't matter. Here's your triangle. And you want to know the area in here. Okay, now. I have drawn it, and I probably, let me correct this a little bit, because you may be tempted to uh, I want to make sure that you realize that is not a horizontal line there. Okay. You do not know a base. You do not know a height. You do not know an angle. You don't know anything like that. All you know are the three points. And it doesn't matter where you call them, x1, y1, x2, y2, and x3, y3. It doesn't matter where you put them, you know, which one you name what. Here is the thing that you use. If you drop down a diagonal here, this is the x1. You know that. And drop down a diagonal here. You know this is the x3 and drop down a diagonal here, and you know this is the x2. Okay. Now, notice what you have here. Okay. You have more than, but all you need is three trapezoids. Okay. Now, I'm going to color these. Give me a color for one of them. Pick a color. Say again. Red. Okay, I'll do the bright red here. Fire truck red. That will be this one right here. That's a trapezoid, right? Okay. Now, the area of that trapezoid, you know the base. The base is x3 minus x1. And I hope you remember how to do the area of a trapezoid. I'm going to dot this in. I'll try to erase it later. But if you did this trapezoid, flipped it over the diagonal, you might say, and have this side over here, and then this short side on the long side here, you get 
the same area, don't you? Well, guess what? You know what this point is, too. This is y1 plus y3. The, the, the y value is y1 plus y3, right? And so is this side, y1 plus y3. So you have a rectangle. You know the base. The base of that rectangle is x3 minus x1. And you know the length of that rectangle is y1 plus y3. And multiply them together and you get the twice the area of that trapezoid. So take half of it. So one half y1 plus y3 times x3 minus x1 over 1. And you can multiply those things out and you will get a bunch of cross terms. You'll have an x1, a x3, y1, you'll have a, a x1, y1, you'll have a x3, y3, and you'll have a, uh, what am I missing? One more. x3, y, x1, y3. You'll have those terms in there with various signs attached, attached to them. Okay. That's going to be the area, the red area here. Okay. Now, Give me another color. Blue? Light blue? Uh, Carolina blue or me medium blue? Say again? Doesn't matter. Let's do the medium blue. Okay? So let's do this one. This trapezoid here, going up to there, and going down here and here. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I messed that up. I meant to this trapezoid. Okay. That one right there. And we're going to do the same thing we did before that I messed up. Okay. We're going to Flip this across its diagonal and build it up. I'm, I don't have enough room for it, but you can imagine this, this side here is that length there, so it goes way up there somewhere. Okay, man, I just lost it. And then the short side here, that goes up here somewhere. Almost fits here. So you have twice the area of that one. But now, what are your coordinates here? Your x-coordinate is x2 minus x1. And your y-coordinate is y1 plus y2. Okay? And then that's the rectangle. Take half of it, and you got the area of the trapezoid. Okay? And again, you're going to have all those cross terms in there. Let me make sure. Yeah, don't know Joshua yet. Okay. And then the third trapezoid. Give me a color. Green. Green. Okay, I'll take the darker green there. And that's this trapezoid. It starts down here. Goes up to there. Goes down to here down to here again, like this. And then do the same thing. Put the, flip it over and it goes and makes a rectangle there. And its height of that rectangle that you have there is y2 plus y3. And the x coordinate is x3 minus x2. But that is the triangle. Take half of it and you got the area of the rectangle. And when you multiply those out, you get all those cross terms uh, y2, x3s, and x3, y3s, and x2, y2s, and x2, y3s. Okay, with plus or minus signs scattered around, you know, whatever. Then what you do is the Blue plus 
across the green, that would be this trapezoid, the blue trapezoid, plus the area of the green trapezoid, subtract from it the area of the red trapezoid, right? That would be here. These two added, subtract that one, and now you have the area of the triangle. Blah, 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 okay? If you were to do all that math and get all those cross terms and put them together, you'll find out that's exactly what you got in this determinant. Amazing, but true, okay? Um, now, you probably didn't want all that explanation, but that's where it comes from. And the book, I think, does go into fairly gory detail there and shows that is exactly what you got. I think it's far more useful to just see how we use it, okay? So let's do that. We've got the formula. Let's put it to use. You're an engineer, not a mathematician. That's what you want to do, right? Here... You want to find the area of the, the triangle whose vertices are this. 1, 1, 2, 2, and 4, 3. If that had been a 3, 3, I'd know that has no area. How would I know that? Because those have been on the straight line, the diagonal line that forms the y is equal to x. Not going to happen. Since that 4, 3 is not collinear with the other two, neither is it, it just can't be. If one arm's off center, off the line, then you have a triangle. So what's the area of that triangle? Plus or minus one half the determinant of, you tell me. be one 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 two two one four three one and rather than closing out my determinant this is a three by three we know our favorite way to do that repeat the first two columns one two four and one two three and then let's do that's not really a determinant but I'm showing it that way let's do the calculation that will be one plus or minus one half times first entry there is a two, the next entry is a four, and the next entry is a six. Okay? Now I know these are all going to be minuses because um, everything in here is a positive number. They don't have to be. You could have chosen. Numbers with negative x or y or both or whatever. It doesn't matter. Okay? So let's do our up diagonals. That's going to be a minus 8. This one's going to be a minus 3. And this one's going to be another minus 3. Yay. Okay. Minus 3. Okay? Now, it's going to be a plus 12 inside there and a minus 14. So I think that comes out of minus 3. Is that right? That doesn't right. Plus 12. Minus 14. That seems like it's right. Oh, that's a minus 2. Goodness gracious, I can't add or subtract or something. Minus 2. Okay. Is that right now? <laughs> Uh, 6 minus 8 would be a minus 2 plus 2 is 0. And then you get 4 minus 6 is minus 2. Well, half of minus 1 half of minus 2 is going to be 1. So the area of the triangle formed by those three points is going to be 1. Right? Or not? They say it's eight minus one half. So what did I do wrong here? Did I write my numbers right? I think so. I wrote the, those right. And the last entry doesn't make any sense. 
Oh, that's a two. I read that as a three. Got it. Yeah, you get a, a negative one in the. Okay, that's a, a two. You see, my two looked like a three there, and I misread that. So that's a minus two, and then the minus two and plus two add to zero. You get plus ten minus eight is minus. Plus 10 minus 11 is minus 1, and then multiply that by minus 1 half, and you get 1 half. Okay. The area is 1 half. Pretty small area. Not surprising because that 1, 2 is on that diagonal line and 4, 3 is not far off the diagonal line. So that's going to be the, a very skinny triangle. And sure enough, this area is only 1 half. Okay. The positive side of it. Now they said something a little different from what I said. They said, well, what if you had chosen that first point to be a 0, 1? and then a 2-2, two, two, and then a 4-3. You see the slope between negative uh, 0, 1, and 2-2 two, two would be a 1 over 2, and then the slope between 2-2 two, two and 4-3 would be a 1 over 2. Same slope, same line, okay? So that would have given you a 0 determinant. Okay, if you had had the point zero one two two and four three, goodness gracious, I can't write. Okay, four three, those would have been collinear, and if you did that, uh, and all that that means is, let's just do it quickly. Well, I don't even need to do that. Make that a zero and that a zero. Everything else is the same here. So then you would have had uh, an eight. Oh, wait, wait, I'm sorry. A zero here, a four there. So this would have been a zero. That would have been a four. And that would have been a six. I got the two right there. And then the up diagonal would have been a minus eight and a zero. And then a minus two plus 10, minus 10, 0. Well, since that's true, that any time the three points would be on the line, guess what? Now we can test to see whether any three points are collinear or not. And how we do that? Take the determinant. If the determinant is 0, the three points are collinear. It's that same determinant. The determinant of x1, y1, 1, x2, y2, 1, x3, y3, 1. If you take the determinant of that and it turns out being 0, that means those three points are on the same line. So there you have a test for um, collinear. Test to see if three points are on the same line. You're not interested in the area of a triangle. You're just seeing if these three points are on the same line. If that determinant is zero, they are on the same line. Okay. So, um, that then leads for to another possibility. What if you had, now I'm going to, all I'm going to do is remove one set of subscripts and change the others. Okay, so I'm going to remove these subscripts and change these. To one, one and two, two. Now here's the situation. Now you're given two points in the plane and you want to determine the equation for the line through those two points. Here's what you do. You set up the first row to be just x, y. 
those are your variables x, y. And then set up the other two to be the two points you were given. And then you take the determinant, set it equal to zero, and that gives you your equation of the line. Okay? That's the two-point form of a, an equation for a line. So let's see how that actually works. Okay. Here we have two points. 2, 4, and negative 1, 3. First time they've given us one that's not positive, okay? Still works, okay? So what we're going to do is set up our determinant, and the determinant will be x, y, 1. The first one is just the variable, okay? The second one is 2, 4, 1. And the third one is minus 1, 3, 1. Okay? You ever play basketball? There was a zone defense that we used to play called the 1-3-1. One, one. I'll always like that when I say it. Okay, repeat the first two columns. X, 2, minus 1. And Y, 4, 3. Do your expanded determinant. That would give you... 4x, and by the way, you don't need it, anything in front of this, no halves, no plus or minus, you just do it. That would give you 4x minus y plus 6, right? Now I'll do the up diagonals. Remember to change signs of them. Okay. The up diagonal would be plus 4, because it would have been a minus 4, so plus 4, minus 3x, three. Three plus, minus 2y. I should have done the plus 4 here. That would have kept me more even. Okay. And then add these things together. And this has to equal 0, by the way. So this would be x minus 3y plus 10 is equal to 0 or is equal to negative 10. Either way you want to say it. Okay? Well, let's see. Is that true? Is this point 2, 4 on that line? 2 times 2 Minus 3 times 4 would be minus 12. 2 minus 12 is minus 10. Yeah, that's on that line. Is the next one. Negative 1 minus 3 times 3 minus 9. Yep, that's minus 10 too. Yep, there's an equation of line that has those two points on it. Okay? Now you could leave it, and they, they wrote it this way too. Ha! Huh. Amazing. I... Never knew you could use determinants well, until I did took a linear algebra course that you could do this. And it's a pretty nifty way to do it. You just have to remember what determinant to do. Well, if you could do areas using a determinant, can you calculate the volume doing a determinant? Well, you can if that volume is a tetrahedron. Do you know what tetrahedron means? Tetra means four, and hedron means sides, basically. So it's a four-sided figure, uh, just a four-sided figure. Now, don't think of that as a square. A square is, I mean, a, a cube. A cube is a six-sided figure. A tetrahedron must have some sort of a triangular base, and then one point that's somewhere above or below that base, and then you connect each of the vertices to each other, and you have a four-sided figure called the tetrahedron, okay? And then they just give this to you, and I will too. You need that one up here any longer? No, okay. Here's what the volume of uh, any old tetrahedron that had, now this is three-dimensional space. You're no longer in the plane, you're in space. So you have x1, y1, Z1, that's one point in space. 
you have another point, x sub 2, y sub 2, z sub 2 in space. And you have another one, x sub 3, y sub 3, z sub 3 in space. And you have another one, four points, four vertices for your four sides, x sub 4, y sub 4, and z sub 4. Okay, four points in space. Now, these four points can't be on, in the same plane. If they are, <laughs> the volume's going to be zero. So these cannot be coplanar points. These have to be four points not in the same plane. So, what's the volume of that tetrahedron with those four vertices? Here's what it is. The vert volume of the tetrahedron, this is not a triangle anymore, but a tetrahedron, is, again, plus or minus, because you could have a determinant with a negative sign. This time the coefficient is 1 6, not 1 half, but 1 6, times the determinant of the x sub 1, y sub 1, z sub 1, 1, x sub 2, y sub 2, z sub 2, 1, x sub 3, y sub 3, z sub 3, 1, and x sub 4, y sub 4, z sub 4, 1. So you see why it has to be four vertices, which makes it have to be a tetrahedron. To do a determinant, you have to have a square matrix. Uh, and since I have no dimensions beyond three that I can conceive, this is as far as this thing goes in my mind. And that will give you the volume. Believe it or not, it will. Believe it or not, you've just got a more complicated problem because uh, four by four is, there's no easy rule for it. So you have to break it down into some three by threes and then use your rule for three, three by threes. Or you can do row reduction, which I think is really the way to go. So let's do example seven. Do we have time for example seven? How are we doing on time? Yeah, about five or six minutes. Okay. Let's at least set up. I don't know if we'll finish it because, well, it will. Well, I don't know. Let's see. Let's go to a new slide. Because I sure don't have room on this one for it. Well, they don't even listen for you. They say, find the volume of the tetrahedron shown that has these four vertices. Okay. Uh, 225, 400, zero, zero, 352, and 041. Now, I can almost hear you thinking, does the order matter here? No, it really doesn't. And here's why. Because remember that plus or minus? What do we get if we exchange two rows in a matrix? How does that change the determinant of the matrix? It changes the sign. So, no, it's not going to matter what you do because you have a plus or minus to, to take care of any sign changes. So what you do, the volume of this tetrahedron it's going to be plus or minus 1, 6 is the coefficient here, the determinant of this one. 2, 2, 5, 1. 4, 0, 0, 1. 3, 5, 2, 1. And 0, 4, 1, 1. Okay. No way to expand this and do it an easy way. You almost just have to grunt and bear it. Now, in my mind, or what would you say is the easy way to approach this one? Is that uh, the second row fourth column? Okay, and you're going to use that and reduce it from there? Okay. I agree that's a good way to approach. Use that second row because it has the most zeros in it. 
But from what we learned before, remember that if we can reduce that 4 to be a 0 using column reduction, remember those are le legal, and the, using determinants, okay? Uh, and all you're doing is multiple of one row to add that to another row. That's what you're using. It doesn't change the determinant any. So I think I would do a minus 4 times column 4 plus column 1. That's going to make a zero here, and then you'll have a three by three, and I think that will be a little bit easier. Okay? It may not be much, but it'll be a little bit. So let's see. How are we doing? Two minutes. Okay? Let's try it. Plus or minus one six times the determinant of, and minus four times one is minus four plus two is minus two. And then we'll have a 2, 5, 1. That stays the same. Minus 4 plus 4 is 0. And you have a 0, 0, 1. Those stay the same. Minus 4 times 1 is minus 4 plus 3 is minus 1. 5, 2, 1 stays the same. And then minus 4 times uh, 1 is minus 4 plus 0 is minus 4, 4, 1, 1. Okay. Then we'll do the terminal with that one. Now, that may not be much easier than what you said, but let's see what happens. How are we doing? Oh, one more minute. Okay, plus or minus 1, 6 times. Okay, first let's determine the sign of that 1 that's over here, right? We're going to use that one. What's the sign there? Uh, plus, minus, plus, minus, plus. So that's going to be a 1, so I'm not even going to write it down. The determinant that's left over, negative 2, 2, 5, and since it's going to be a 3 by 3, negative 2, 2. Okay? Negative 1, 5, 2. Negative 1, 5. Negative 4, 4, 1. Negative 4, 4. Yeah! All right, let's see what we got. Plus or minus 1, 6. Don't forget that's out there. Okay. Now what we have here is a minus 10, minus 16, minus 20. Okay. You got a hundred? Wow, you're quick. Oh, you mean you had, well, okay, you've already done it all and gotten a hundred, right? Yeah, oh. Say that again. Yeah. Oh, oh, I see. Okay. And that's gonna be a that's gonna be a plus a hundred, right? Okay. Plus a hundred. Okay, good for you. Plus 16, is that right? Yeah, and then a plus 2. Okay, is that what you got? Okay, I'm going to wipe out the plus and minus 16, they're easy. And then the two minuses add to minus 30 plus 100 is uh, 70 plus 2 is 72. And I'll take the plus one sixth of 72 would be 12. Let's see, is that what they got? They put it in different order. They did whatever they did. They got 12 cubic units is the answer. Good for them. I'm so proud of them. Okay, and we went a minute over, but there will be no extra charge. Okay, we'll pick up next time at test for coplanar points in space. And we'll pick up and go from there. Homework exercises here would include any of the odds, 1 through 7. They're all at calcchat.com. Any of the odds, 9 through 21. They're at calcchat.com. Any of the odds, 23 through 20, either 23 or 25. They're both at calcchat.com. 27 is at calcchat.com. 
29 or 31 are at couchchat.com, 33 or 35 are at couchchat.com, uh, 37 and 39 are at couchchat.com, and 41 through 45 are at couchchat.com. Stop there and take a breath and go on from there. We'll pick up from there and go. And Oh, and I did receive, though I haven't graded it yet, I think your first test, wasn't it? Okay, good. Thank you so much. Remember, you still got a paper in test two, and we got test three coming up very soon. In fact, it'll probably be, since we're in 3.4 now, this is the last section in the set. So on Tuesday, I will be sending you the invite and sending you the third test. Okay? On chapter three. All right. Have a good, safe weekend. Got plenty of plenty of algebra to keep you busy and out of trouble, right? And we'll see you then. And probably a little bit of Cal 3, too, right? So we'll see you next Monday. Have a good weekend. All right. Any questions? All right. See you then. Stop the share if I could get it to stay in one place. And end the meeting for all. And then we stop the recording.